hello to everybody. I'm, I'm going to keep glancing up here as people come into the waiting room so I can admit them. <clears throat> uh, thanks for attending our club luncheon. And I'd like to mention our club luncheon sponsor, Albrecht and Albrecht Law Firm has been supporting this luncheon for several years now. Their areas of practice include employee rights, wills, trusts, and estate planning, business planning, real estate, and general civil litigation. So if you need help, legal help, please think about using Albrechta and Albrechta. Uh, the goal of the club is to bring together all Democrats from the most conservative to the most progressive to celebrate our shared values, appreciate who we are, and to work together to put more Democrats in office. Our program today will feature Lori Meininger discussing the state of the state. I'm gonna talk about the procedure here for just a second. Everyone's asked to stay muted except for the candidates, myself, candidates, we don't have candidates. I left that in from last month. The speaker, myself, and Kathy Devine and Karen Pontius will be handling questions. So if you wanna submit questions during the luncheon, please use the chat feature on Zoom. Um, please do not unmute yourself and speak. And make sure that when you use the chat in that little drop down by two, make sure it says everyone. And that way, uh, <clears throat> Karen and Kathy will both get the question and, and, and yeah, they'll share them. Um, if you're having trouble with your internet connectivity, you may want to disable your video. Audio only works a little better on slower connections. And you can just click on the video button until it shows a red line through the button. Uh, this Zoom meeting is being recorded and should be available within a few days for viewing. Um, you can also choose speaker mode, which is typically in the upper right-hand corner, and that'll bring up a larger window of the person speaking. Uh, while the La Plata County Dems are okay on funds for right now, some of our biggest fundraisers have had to be canceled due to the pandemic over the last year. So I would encourage everyone to donate to the party, and monthly donations are particularly appreciated, and you can set those up on Act Blue so they happen automatically. And monthly donations make it easy for you to give to the party with relatively little pain. Uh, this is our fifth club luncheon for, for 2021. The club luncheon committee has been working to bring some great programs for the coming year, and I think you'll really enjoy them. Next month, we will feature Maya Kane discussing voter suppression efforts around the country. And in July, Attorney General Phil Weiser will be with us remotely. Uh, the committee is also considering when we might be able to do these luncheons in person again, so stay tuned for that. And if anyone has any other announcements to make, please enter something in the chat window, and we'll recognize you at the end of the luncheon. Now, let's give a big virtual welcome to Lori Meininger. Go ahead, Lori. Thanks, everybody. Right yeah, thanks. Um, so um, thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's always a pleasure to be among friends. Um, and without naming names, I just want to acknowledge that we've got a couple of other Tired foreign service folks um, with us today. So thanks for being here. Um, so as a former retired foreign service officer, it's a pleasure to be able to share with you my personal opinion on some of the issues of our time, something that I wasn't able to do as an executive level federal employee governed by, among other things, a code of ethics and the Hatch Act, both of which I took seriously during my time with the State Department. Um, that said, as some of you know, I'm on the board of directors of the League of Women Voters in La Plata County, and I want to make perfectly clear that I'm here with you today as a private citizen and not representing any organization or affiliation. So now that the dis disclaimers have been handled, let's get started. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to give you some insight into these questions. What is the health of the State Department after four years under the Trump administration? What are the issues facing our nation's diplomats this year and in the near future? What is the strategy to address those challenges and why should we care? So I'm bringing to this conversation a perspective of 18 years in the Foreign Service. So being a diplomat was a second career and one which I shared with my late husband, who was also a foreign service officer. And during the time that we served, we were posted to the countries of the Marshall Islands, Cameroon, Guyana, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Romania, Iraq, Central African Republic. And for my last assignment, I served as the deputy chief of mission and charge d'affaires in Sierra Leone 
a country that most of you know um, for its reputation of having child soldiers, blood diamonds, and Ebola, which was just starting to be controlled when I arrived there for my assignment. And like many of our Foreign Service colleagues, we served in times of war and peace under several administrations and political party changes in Washington. And we served with gratitude for the opportunity to represent our country. It was a great privilege and full of insights and interesting adventures, to say the least. Diplomacy has been called the second oldest profession. Officially, diplomacy is defined as the profession, activity, or skill of managing in international relations, typically led by a country's representatives abroad. And I have a paperweight on my desk that was a gift from my mom that also defines diplomacy as the art of helping someone see things your way. So either way you define it, the primary objective of diplomacy is to protect and defend a nation's people, interests, and values. And I would also offer the opinion that building mutually beneficial bilateral and multilateral relationships across the globe is the most effective way to achieve that primary objective. Diplomacy is not a solo mission. Now, I know that many folks think that diplomacy is nothing more than cocktail parties and pinstripe suits like in the movies. And to many Americans, diplomacy is something that someone does somewhere and doesn't really have anything to do with them. That is until they lose their passport while traveling or want to adopt internationally, or they want to sell their products abroad or engage in a business investment overseas, like our local Osprey Pax company, or they need to protect their intellectual property rights, or they get cacked, or crops fail because of global warming and a drought, or they get sick due to a global health pandemic, and of course, none of those things have ever happened to anybody here. And most of the time, diplomacy is seen, excuse me, diplomacy is something that in the process of being conducted can't easily be seen and often takes a great deal of time. But the results are with us in our everyday lives, and we often don't even think about the role that diplomacy might have played. So here's a fun fact, and to bring it a little closer to home. Thomas Jefferson, one of our nation's first diplomats, we all know from our American history, negotiated the Louisiana Purchase, which resulted in obtaining land for 15 of our present states, including where we're all sitting now, the state of Colorado. So what are the current challenges for the State Department? I think we need to start talking about those challenges internally. So for many years, I think diplomacy has been sidelined and the State Department became increasingly mil militarized. And by that, I mean that the National Security Council and the Department of Defense have been driving our foreign policy with a counterterrorism focus as an aftermath of 9-11. So that's been going on now for almost 20 years. And it evolved over several administrations, including Republican and Democratic under Bush and Obama. But during the last administration, a crushing blow was dealt to the department's effectiveness with first, with Trump's appointment of the grossly inexperienced and ineffective Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State, and continued with his repeated bullying of senior officials and ambassadors. It continued further with his battle cry to clean out the swamp while filling positions across the federal government with unqualified party loyalists and with his ridiculous accusations about a quote, deep state, unquote, comprised of senior career government officials set out to do him in. So I have a friend, Nancy McEldowney, um, with whom I worked um, in Washington, and she's retired as the director of the State Department's Foreign Service Institute, where I taught for two years teaching leadership. And here's what she had to say about deep state. She said, deep state is both inaccurate and grossly misleading. 
The term originated in the context of analyzing the situations in Turkey and Egypt years ago and was usually used to talk about propaganda, dirty tricks, and even violence to overthrow the government. To refer to career civil servants in the US government as some form of deep state is a clear attempt to delegitimize voices of disagreement, she added. And she went on to say, even worse, it carries with it the potential for fear baiting and rumor mongering and is really a dark conspiratorial term that does not correspond to reality. So under Pompeo's reign, department officers at all levels were clearly mistrusted by Secretary Pompeo and his cronies. And dissent, a crucial tool in diplomacy and in the formulation of foreign policy, and I think quite frankly necessary in all healthy institutions, was not only unwelcome, but it was used against those brave enough to speak up. Do you all remember Ambassador Marie Ivanovich? Swagger became the modus operandi during Pompeo's reign, and it had a far-reaching chilling effect on the workforce, as well as damage the department's standing in the international community. And I don't know about you, but I don't associate swagger with the skill, patience, and presence of mind that the craft and art of diplomatic relations requires. And frankly, Neither did most of our allies, while our so-called enemies use this bullying language and posturing to their political advantage. Needless to say, over the four years of the prior administration, this behavior and these tactics left a demoralized workforce in their wake. But in late 2020, with a new opportunity afforded by the change in administration, a group of very well-respected former State Department senior officials held dozens of workshops and met with more than 200 people individually, including high-level military and intelligence community colleagues, active duty and retired State Department personnel, as well as with members of Congress, the former Secretaries of State Albright, Powell, and Clinton, as well as two former Joint Chiefs of Staff and two former CIA directors to look at what needs to happen for the State Department to move into the 21st century and recover from the past four years. So as a result, they developed several recommendations which have been presented to the Biden administration and for which there's reason to believe that there may be some bipartisan support. So Gwen, if you'll show that first slide, I'm going to go through their 10 point recommendations. Can you all see that? Perfect. So their first recommendation was to redefine a 21st century mission. So modern issues like terrorism and intertwined global economy, the melting of the polar ice caps and cybersecurity weren't even imagined at the end of World War II, which was the last time the department seriously looked at its mission. Secondly, they're recommending revising the Foreign Service Act of 1980 to reinforce the principles upon which the department is funded. So ensuring that the Foreign Service is non-political, that there is objective criteria for appointing ambassadors, that the function of peer review is robust, that the out, up or out system of promotion is maintained, and insisting on worldwide availability of personnel. They also recommend changing the culture um, from being risk averse in all things to what they consider to be appropriate risk taking. So the aftermath of the political aftermath, I would say, from Benghazi um, led has led to a much more conservative view, not only on physical security for those serving overseas, but it's also spilled over into our policy making as well. And diplomats are not feeling empowered to speak truth to power. Four is a relentless focus on diversity so that the department actually reflects the diversity of the nation. And 
Number five is interesting to me because I served under Colin Powell and the recommendation is to increase the professional education and training. And when Colin Powell was secretary, he was asked once how many years of, or how much education and training had he received in the military in his career, to which he said, seven years, how much have you gotten in the State Department? And the person answering the question said, well, language training aside, I'd say it's probably been a few months. So the effort would be to professionalize or increase the professionalism of the State Department. Modernizing the system to allow for a float to 15% to permit that training. Um, and number seven is also interesting to me to improve the mid level entry into the Foreign Service. So, when my husband and I went into the Foreign Service, we went in as professionals from prior other careers. We were people in our 40s, and we brought with us a certain amount of professional and life experience, yet, we were paid the same and treated in the same way in the system as the 22 year old in my class who had just graduated from college. I also like number eight to establish a reserve corps to help with surge capacity or emergencies around the world and to bring specialized expertise. So I served a lot of my time in the State Department in Africa. I developed a certain amount of expertise around how certain West and Central African countries function. Um, not only that, I was a consular officer. Um, so bringing expertise in that professional field for assistance to American citizens or um, visas. And number nine is the one where the um, the authors of these recommendations got pushed back from every political um, party person they spoke with, and that's to depoliticalize senior level appointments. So their recommendation is to decrease the number of political appointees by 20% over the next five years. And that's not just politically appointed ambassadors, but it's also the senior levels of the State Department their belief, the author's belief, and I would agree with this, is that we have a cadre of professional diplomats. Let those folks be the leaders of the department and not put in place um, political appointees. And it's interesting to me that the United States is the only diplomatic corps that permits political appointees in such large numbers. And then the last one I think is particularly timely and it had a lot of support from the folks that they talked with. And that's to rename the Foreign Service to the US Diplomatic Service. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that people said, well, you know, who do you work for? And I said, well, I work for the Department of State. And they're like, oh, really, what state? I think the US Diplomatic Service as a name would signal that major transfer formation being proposed while reinforcing the fact that it puts the US first. It clearly tells that the work is about diplomacy and maintains the word service, which certainly is what that is, no different than military service. So Gwen, if you would put the second slide up, I want to move to talk about what I think some of our external foreign policy challenges include. So at the top of that list, and this is not in any particular order, but it's a list that I've been working on for a while, um, I would put global health. Clearly, all of us have had the experience over the past 16 months or so um, of the effects of COVID-19. I've previously shared with you that I served in a country where Ebola um, was a threat to our global health. Um, and so now we have the challenge of global post-pandemic recovery. Uh, for those here in Durango, the article last week in the Herald pointed out the increased cost of building materials as a result of the disruption of the supply chain. Supply chain. And I was hearing just yesterday an interview with the CEO of Intel and about how the disruption of the supply chain means that we might not actually be having microprocessing units available for a year or two. High on this list also is the climate. And all of us here struggle with various kinds of impacts of climate change. But I would add this new um, diplomatic um, 
opportunity, and that's Arctic diplomacy. So the countries of the US, Russia, Canada, Norway, and Denmark all have northern borders on the Arctic Circle or above the Arctic Circle. And the climate, the change in climate and global warming means that for the first time ever, because of the thawing of ice, borders are being exposed that previously were inaccessible because they were encased in ice. So for a country like Russia, what it's seeing now is that it now has thousands more miles of border that it needs to defend. So it creates a change, a, dip, a significant change in the relationship between Russia and these other countries and the rest of the world in terms of shipping, um, military defense, and so on. Fragile states, we see the effects of that here from Central America. Um, our European um, friends and neighbors see the effects of fragile states in Africa, and we're seeing the effects in Southeast Asia. And I have that above, eroding democracies, shifting populations, immigration, poverty, food and water insecurity, because all of those things are a result of fragile states. And I would say that democracies, when democracies begin to erode, we see things in countries falling apart, like in Venezuela um, or in Myanmar. Um, and in terms of our partnerships, you know, we're in a position of needing to rebuild our alliances with our European allies, for example. And in 2020, actually it was in 2019, was the largest number of internally and externally displaced persons ever in history. What's true as humans is that we move around the globe all the time, but never before in our human history have there been so many people who are displaced because of circumstances out of their control, whether they are climate driven, politically driven, economically driven. And most of the refugees that we're seeing are economic refugees. So for us, then it creates this issue around immigration. Um, and we haven't had, um, I, in my opinion, um, helpful immigration policy in this country for a hundred years. Poverty and economic inequality, I won't read the list verbatim, but these are the issues that face all of us that are th possible threats and or opportunities in terms of our foreign policy. And just think about what's been happening in the news in the past few weeks. Regional instability, the war, the most recent war between Israel and Palestine, and the public power, the foreign policy of a two nation state. Um, the nuclear capabilities, trying to get Iran back into um, the agreement, <laughs> the treaty that we left, um, and how do we recover from the posturing that we had with North Korea a couple of years ago? Um, last two items, I would say security, and I don't mean the kind of security that the Department of Defense is focused on in terms of counterterrorism in places like the Sahel in North Africa, um, or even if in Afghanistan, but more closely at home, cybersecurity, and then um, authoritarianism. And just think about the recent events in Belarus with the taking down of a, an aircraft and the military takeover of the government in Myanmar. So these are not small issues um, that face um, our diplomats. So Gwen, thank you for sharing the screen. I appreciate that. So these issues stated another way um, by Secretary of State Lincoln um, were part of a speech that he gave back in March entitled A Foreign Policy for the American People. And this is what he said. So here's our plan. First, we will stop COVID-19 and strengthen global health security. Second, we'll turn around the economic crisis and build a more stable, inclusive global economy. Third, we will renew democracy because it's under threat. Fourth, we will work to create a humane and effective immigration system. Fifth, we will revitalize our ties with allies and partners. Sixth, we'll tackle the climate crisis and drive a green energy revolution. Seventh, 
we will secure our leadership in technology. And eight, we will manage the biggest geopolitical test of the 21st century, our relationship with China. So in about a hundred words, he took all of those issues and made them sound so easy. But in fact, it's not. But what I do take hope in is that he's actually articulated this list as his focus on the issues that matter most of all to most Americans. And for me, it suggests that this administration clearly understands the role of diplomacy and is supporting it. So, and, and just yesterday, um, we all heard the remarks of the president at Arlington Cemetery when he said, democracy itself is in peril here at home and around the world. And in a theme that we've heard President Biden um, articulate many times, went on to say, empathy is the fuel of democracy. We must have a willingness to see each other not as enemies, but as neighbors, even when we disagree, to understand what the other is going through. And he also went on to talk about this rising wave of autocratic rule across the world and argued that liberation, opportunity, and justice are far more likely to come to pass in a democracy than an autocracy. So where are we going and how do we get there? I think clearly in the first few months of this administration, the messaging from Washington has changed for the better, in my opinion, um, acknowledging um, that we have other neighbors in the world and that there might be the possibility of some partnership is a step in the right direction. Um, but I think that you'll all agree that these challenges are potential threats to our national interests, our ideals, as well as our national and individual well being, and should be undertaken by a cadre of the most professionally capable diplomats possible. And I think that we'll begin to see over the next several months where these bold declarations by Secretary Blinken and the administration take us. And there are some important meetings coming up, um, even just within the next few weeks, where I think our metal may actually be tested. Um, and in order to meet these challenges, I think that the, it is the imperative of the State Department that it get its house in order and strengthen the institution that holds the space, if you will, for the work of diplomacy to be conducted at currently 276 missions in 195 countries. And then just in closing, I, I would say, in case you haven't figured it out, um, that I'm passionate about the tremendous, often unsung work being done every day by dedicated men and women living far from their families who are working to promote our American ideals, values, and prosperity around the world. And so bringing it a little bit closer to home, when we, all of us here are well-informed citizens. We can speak up and voice our support for the State Department and its work, express our opinion on the foreign policy issues that we are passionate about. Um, and by the way, um, diplomacy and non-military international engagement is still less than 2% of our national budget. So I think we have the opportunity to make our voices heard on matters that concern us. And honestly, everything on that list concerns us. Regional stability, strong economies, a healthy planet, and governments that uphold the rights of all citizens make the world a better place for all of us, even here in Durango. Wars are ended, or better yet, prevented, because diplomats sit at the negotiating table. And I would argue diplomacy is a more important than ever tool in the American toolkit. The work of Blinken's eight point plan will be aimed at addressing all of the current global threats to our nation's health and well being. And I believe that that is work worthy of our nation. So thank you. Um, I'm happy to hear your thoughts and take any questions. Okay, thank you, Laurie. Um, Kathy or Karen, I see at least one question in the- Yeah, I'll go, I'll go first, it's in the chat. Uh, it's regarding, uh, Laurie, it's, uh, that was a, a great presentation, thank you. Um, this is regarding the uh, culture of uh, risk aversion. 
And uh, this person is asking if you can give some examples of what changes would look like from that policy position and how is a, uh, appropriate risk defined? <laughs> So I think as a culture, the State Department is inherently um, conservative. And I don't mean politically conservative, but I mean institutionally conservative. Um, and it always has been. Um, but what it could look like, for example, um, so we have, we don't have, um, missions in four countries around the world um, because of for reasons of personal safety and or political reasons. So um, I'm guessing you all might figure out what those are, but to make that easier. So we don't have diplomats in residence in um, Iran, North Korea, Bhutan, or Syria. And Syria is probably the most um, contentious in terms of risk management for people. So we have observers and people who are engaged in political conversation with those countries, but who sit in countries far away. So there's an entire Syria team that's posted to the embassy in London. So one of the conversations that persists is, do we put diplomats back in Syria, for example? So when we think about in terms of the Middle East and what our um, long-term concerns and objectives there, how would it suit us um, or would it serve us better to have people on the ground in Syria than to continue to have folks in London? So that could be um, one of those. And then I think in terms of policy, <laughs> um, I think Hillary Clinton started a, a a language in the department when she was secretary, and it's something that has become part of the American vernacular, but that's talking about um, speaking truth to power. And when people are afraid of what's going to happen to them, when they speak truth um, to power and speak about the truth about what's going on in a particular country, um, then there's not an opportunity for affecting change. Um, so I'll take the example um, of when I was um, in Sierra Leone. So we were there, our, a lot of our focus was on Ebola. Um, and I had about 250 um, folks working under me in a team. Um, and we were included as part of the um, global health security agenda. And one of the things that we realized right away is that for a country like Sierra Leone, who had a completely dismantled healthcare system, some of the loftier ideals of the global um, security, health security agenda were never going to be able to be accomplished. Um, <laughs> but it took several of us working up through the ranks, if you will, um, to be able to keep Sierra Leone in the compact of 16 other countries, um, but to be able to negotiate concessions in that agreement um, on their behalf. And we got a lot of pushback all the time. There was sort of this attitude of, look, people in Washington made up this fantastic policy. We're telling you what that is. You all just have to go forth and enact that. And we're saying, you know, the truth is on the ground here, that's not going to get enacted in the way you think. And so empowering um, diplomats to actually report truthfully what's happening in the countries where they are and not penalizing them for telling the truth that might not be the truth that somebody wants to hear about in Washington. Okay, Karen, I think there's a couple more questions. My dog will stop barking. Uh, okay, Bonnie asks, is there something within the State Department that you would say is a weakness or area of concern and one that is a particular strength where we have more opportunity for a positive impact? Um, I think a current weakness is that much of the um, there's an entire generation of folks who left the State Department during the last administration, either by their own um, volition 
or because they were forced out. Um, and that is an entire generation of not just historical knowledge, but the expertise that I was talking about earlier. Um, and I, there, there are a lot of younger, and I don't necessarily mean age-wise, but newer officers, if you will, um, who are very capable. And I think that's where the opportunity is to help build that cadre um, of um, young officers. Um, you know, we ask a lot of our diplomats to live in places around the world where they are far from their families. Um, my husband and I chose to work in the developing world, the whatever nicest in quotation marks country we lived in was Romania. Um, <laughs> and, but that was a choice we made. Um, and we paid the price for that, um, both in terms of being far away from people, but in terms of health, um, long-term health and some other things. So I think what drove us to continue to do that was the satisfaction of feeling like what we were doing actually was making a difference and had no illusions um, that we were affecting um, global um, policy, but strengthening the relationships between the US and the countries where we were um, felt like we actually were making a contribution. And I think rewarding people for those kinds of um, engagements um, would, <laughs> would be an opportunity. Um, and I think that that's part of what the authors of those 10 point recommendations are thinking, how do we incentivize folks to um, show up in places that are not necessarily the garden spots of the world and yet be actively engaged in the kind of diplomacy that is required to be there. So I think the short answer to the question, Bonnie, is we've lost a, a huge amount of professionalism and professional expertise. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity to invest differently um, in the folks who are there. And I think, and I don't mean incentivize in terms of paying people more, um, but to create a culture that recognizes the resilience and the um, contributions that people are making in a different way, I think would go a long way. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, Dick White, um, uh, changing the subject a little bit. Why is there no mission in Bhutan? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. So there hasn't been one um, in Bhutan. Gosh, I could probably look it up, but um, I think probably for fifty years. It's this, it, and it has to do with um, disagreements with the politics in the country and the way that the country is held. Um, so Myanmar is similar. We do have diplomats on the ground in Myanmar, but we refuse to call it, we, the US government refuses to call it Myanmar. We still refer to it as Burma um, <laughs> because the, from a bilateral perspective, we recognize the government structure that is different than the current government structure. And that's the case in Bhutan as well. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> some of it sometimes feels, um, well, the, again, this is very much my personal opinion, but it feels disrespectful of the choices that people have made. Although in the case of Bhutan, I'm not sure it's a choice that they have made um, for their leadership, so. Kind of childish. As there <laughs> <it is. laughs> okay, Karen, you want to field the next one? Yeah, Jessica Wheeler asks, uh, you mentioned we have not had good immigration policy in a hundred years. What do you think would be a good policy? Specifically, mm -hmm. do you have thoughts on the idea of an open border? The Western Slope has historically been reliant on immigrant labor, and now the labor pool is in jeopardy. An open border was re recently advocated for by an Aspen Institute trustee. Um, yeah, I personally um, feel like some of the programs that we've implemented in terms of our um, immigration rules in this country 
um, have been knee-jerk reaction and then knee-jerk reaction again. So one of the programs that um, is um, still in existence is something called the Diversity um, Visa Lottery. And it is simply a lottery. Um, there are a certain number of um, immigration spots, if you will, that are um, allocated every year to nations from which we do not have large numbers of immigrants. Um, so countries like India, the Philippines, all the European countries are not eligible to participate in the lottery. Um, but countries, many of the African countries and some of the Southeast Asian countries can. Um, and it is an attempt um, to bring immigrants into the United States where we don't have large populations. But that whole program was a knee jerk reaction to someone saying, oh, there's too many Mexicans or there's too many Filipinos or there's too many Indians rather than um, acknowledging that most of our immigration policy has to do with an economic foundation. So I agree that, um, in fact, as an aside, um, so I was on a trip to California with my granddaughter earlier this year and we were driving through the Salinas Valley and I'm telling her about the history of Cesar Chavez in the region and migrant farm laborers. And honestly, one of the reasons why we moved away and started living out in the world was we came from a part of Northern California and I'm a native of this part of the country where the only people of color um, in our community were Mexican farm laborers. And they came and worked and sent their money home and lived horribly. Um, and, <laughs> and my granddaughter said, well, why, did, why, why was that happening? And I said, because no one here was willing to do those jobs. And Cesar Chavez stepped up and started speaking for and helping people organize themselves in a way so that they actually enjoyed rights that, while they were here. So, you know, we say that we welcome migrants from this country or to this country, but only of a certain caliber, right? And so those who are working in, um, manual labor jobs we're you know we want them to be here but we're not gonna fully accept that they're here um, because somehow we have this idea that they're disrupting our economic um or our economy which in the fact of the matter is is that that's not true at all um and so i think an, the idea of an open border is an interesting one um, but it comes, not but, and it comes with all kinds of other social um, programs and apparatus that I don't know that we have in place. And I think it would demand from us as a society to um, change a lot of our thinking about how we see migrants to this country, even those that we um, <laughs> welcome through some of the employment-based programs. Um, you know, we have a certain number of immigrants every year that we do want to come into the country because they're bringing with them the science or technology skills or other kinds of specialized skills that we've identified as being needy. And yet when they're here, um, we still have, um, I think, in my opinion, arcane rules about what they can and can't do and how much they can earn and all of those things. So I think there's just a lot of old thinking about migrants and some kind of almost nostalgic um, point of view about migrants um, who like need us and come here. Um, so, I don't know, it's all, it, sorry, that was a very convoluted answer, but, you know, I think the idea of an open border is an interesting one, but I think it would take a lot more um, work and openness on the part of all of us as a society for that to actually um, work for the migrants who come. Um, I'd like to ask a question, Lori. Um, do you know, uh, 
Secretary uh, Blinken, and uh, and uh, whether you do or don't know him personally, what is your opinion of him? And do you think he's the right person for the right job right now? <laughs> well, I don't know him personally, um, except that I had the opportunity to work with him just a little bit. Um, I was, when I was in Iraq, so I served in Iraq for two years and I was in charge of um, a very large um, program to help transfer back to the Iraqi um, civilian authorities, all civilian security in the country. So when the United States invaded Iraq, we took over all of the um, police and military and other kinds of security in the country. So um, nine years later, seven years later, I guess, um, we were trying to put that, give that transfer authority back to the Iraqis. Um, and so um, Ambassador Blinken um, at one point was the special envoy to um, Iraq and came um, and visited. And then we worked together on the dismantling of that program when it became politically untenable um, back home. Um, so I, my experience of him was that he was an absolute um, consummate diplomat extremely um, knowledgeable about not just Iraq, but about the region. Um, Well-respected, um, both internationally and within the department. Um, you know, very, um, very bright. Um, you know, we think about the role of the Secretary of State. So we had that little list of, you know, whatever, eight or 10 issues. Within each of those issues is about a hundred issues, <laughs> and to be able to have a command of um, relationships and ramifications and possible strategies and points of negotiation, I think re requires a certain kind of intellect and person. Um, and so then I think the answer to your question is yes, I do think he is the right person at the right time. Um, I think he's well-respected within the department, well-respected internationally, and certainly has the um, intellectual and um, I would say social capacity um, necessary to be the leader of the department when it needs someone who is a um, skilled and experienced diplomat. That's great to hear, thank you. Yeah, and I'd like to ask a question. I don't see any more in there. If, if people have more questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and I know you were not, or at least from your bio, you weren't uh, directly involved with China, but China has this Belt and Road Initiative. And I know that much of their effort has been into Africa, uh, where you did spend a fair amount of time. I was just wondering, I mean, <clears throat> I know what they're trying to accomplish, but how do you feel that that's working? And is the United States doing anything to try to counter, you know, what the Chinese are doing or, or you know, something similar on our own part? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's working great for China. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I'm guessing that some of you probably participated in the Great Decisions um, session on this as well. What I would say is that kind of stepping back um, and looking at the differences in philosophies in foreign policy between the U.S. and China. And... Uh, those of you who are my friends have probably heard me say this before, but one of the failings that I think we have as a nation in terms of our foreign policy is something that I would just call short attention span. We, um, whether it's our foreign policy or our domestic policy, we are a nation that wants results really quickly. And we have this idea that there should be an immediate return on our investment. Whereas China takes the very, very long view. And they are willing to um, invest in maybe some things in the beginning that don't have an immediate return to them, but that are ingraining them into um, a particular country. And that certainly is what I've seen 
um, both in Africa, and I think we're seeing that as well um, in some of the Southeast Asia work that they're doing. So for example, um, I could use any of the African countries that I served, but um, the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo. It is a nation that is physically the size of all of Western Europe. And it is the country from east to west is divided by one of the largest and most, um, well, oldest and most vast portions of rainforest remaining in the world. And, and it's full of resources that we need, or say we do, um, in our modern world. So lots of resources for minerals that are used in the processing of things that make all of our cell phones work, for example. So China, decades ago, and helped the Congolese government um, invest in port structure. So 3,000 miles away from where the minerals were that eventually they would gain rights to. And they didn't even have the conversation about rights when they invested in those port structures. Fast forward in time, 15 years later, um, because they now are, um, you know, BFFs with the Congolese government, they have access to rights that we won't have um, because they made these deals to help shore up the government in ways that we don't. Now, philosophically, you could say we stick to our moral high ground, and I think that that's right. We don't turn a blind eye to human rights abuses um, that China is engaged in at home and elsewhere in the world. Our American companies have to abide by certain ethical um, codes of ethics that prevent them from doing things like paying bribes and engaging in um, kickback schemes and so on that China is willing to do. So we play the game very differently. We play for the short game and we have a code, a moral code um, that often, governments that are, I would say, less than honorable, um, don't want to adhere to our requirements. And so then it allows a nation like China to go in and play very differently um, than we do. And the fact that they're willing to do that over decades, whereas we'll go in, want to build a project, see a return within a, a few years, five maybe at most, and if that hasn't happened, then we're, we're ready to fold up our tent and move on to the next thing. So um, I think China's influence in Africa um, will be something that we all are going to have to contend with um, over the coming um, decades. Because the other thing that China is doing, and this is where there's a youth bulge, um, is in Africa, the largest growing number of um, young adults is coming out of Africa, and China is all too happy to take those folks um, and give them free education in China. Um, and so they return back to their African countries and become the next generation of leaders. So it's a different perspective and a different way of investing um, in a relationship, and we don't do that. And I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. I'm just saying we go about it very, very differently. It's complicated. <laughs> We've got another question from Dick White. And he, first, are you familiar with the television series, Madam Secretary? <laughs> <laughs> I've watched it a couple times, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think it was a realistic representation of the functioning of the Department of State? I don't know that so much as what I do think it did. And what I liked about it is that it elevated the issues um, to prime time. So when the secretary is having to face, you know, going into a negotiation with a country and having this so we'll use China as an example, have this conversation about enforcing um, our human rights um, values 
into the conversation about investing. Um, I think that was the fact that it was timely with those issues, um, I loved. Whether the secretary actually gets to do all those things herself is debatable. <laughs> That's great. Um, Karen, uh, uh, I don't think we have any more questions, huh? Let me, let me ask one more. <clears throat> I could probably sit here and ask you questions all day, Lori, but uh, I'll ask you one more. Um, you didn't, again, didn't mention Russia particularly in your resume, but you did say Romania, <clears throat> so you'd have been sort of in the neighborhood. Um, and I'm sure that, that you have to have, you know, a lot of background information. And, and it seems like Russia has been this <clears throat> adversary and then, you know, friend and back and forth and obviously all, all that mixed up with the Trump administration. And so, I mean, what, what, what do you see as really sort of the true situation with respect to Russia right now? I don't know that we're ever going to know what the true situation is in Russia. Um, <laughs> um, but here's, here's something that I do know. I think that our, the U.S. relationship with Russia um, has to evolve um, over time. Um, and I don't think we can wait a long time for that to happen. So I had sort of alluded to this before. Most of the foreign policy, um, I would say the foundation of our foreign policy um, and the way that diplomacy is conducted currently is an outgrowth of um, the Cold War. And I think that we come at our foreign policy still with this Cold War um, thinking, um, which sets up this dynamic of two gigantic adversaries who need to prove a point with each other um, and who, quite frankly, on both sides are willing to have um, collateral damage in order to get their way. I think Russia plays that game better than any other country on the planet. Um, and I think you know, I wasn't kidding when I said, I don't think we're ever gonna really know the truth um, because the political machinery of Russia and honestly of many of the former Soviet states is so shrouded in secrecy and mandatory allegiance that, it is not, um, it's not a skill set that we have um, as part of our national um, psyche, if you will. So um, that said, you know, I think this, um, there's an upcoming, um, for the first time ever, a meeting of Russia, Canada, US, Norway, and Denmark to talk about the Arctic Circle. Um, because for the, for the first time in a long time, I think Russia's feeling a little vulnerable um, in that because of global warming in the summer, there is actually now thousands of miles of Russian land exposed to potentially anyone who can move a boat um, up where previously everything was iced over. So they're having to now suddenly think, oh my gosh, we have now this land that we need to protect. How do we do that? Um, does it become another military frontier? If it is, what, what's gonna be the long-term impact of that? And how do we, how we Russia, um, how do we negotiate that with our neighbors and the other folks who share this border? That, that is a new conversation. And I think it's gonna create new opportunities for engagement um, where I think both sides have to be willing to think about the relationship in a slightly different way. And that maybe there's room for cooperation um, that actually works to everyone's benefit rather than just assuming that we're gonna be 
fighting it out um, over those um, territories. So, um, you know, I, I think this is just goes back to what the authors of this sort of 10 point plan are talking about, redefining the mission of the State Department, moving it off of this post World War II um, Cold War entrenchment um and thinking about the role of the united states differently than it's been thought about before and i think that will naturally um, shift the relationship with russia um, and china too all right do we have any more questions kathy or karen i don't think so but just a lot of uh, accolades for Lori's presentation <laughs> Thank yep. you. Thank you guys so much for being interested. And I really appreciate it. And, you know, I feel <laughs> there are people with so much more expertise than I have. Um, but um, thank you for taking a listen. I appreciate it. All right. Well, let's give Laurie a virtual round of applause. <clears throat> and we really thank do appreciate you. you taking your time, Laurie. Yeah. Thanks. For, uh, thanks for asking me. Uh, you're certainly welcome. Again, the recording will be available in a couple of days. Um, does anybody have any other announcements? I haven't seen anything go into the uh, chat window. Um, I might just mention that the next one will be on July the 6th. We debated whether we would try to move that later since that the weekend before that's a holiday weekend, um, but we decided we'd just go ahead and keep it on the 6th. And so again, that'll be Maya Kane talking about voter suppression. And we'll hope to see you then. So thanks, everybody, for attending and have a great day.